we are about to participate in and co-create a very unusual experience. The um, organizers of this event, uh, when we were trying to make a flyer, that uh, Christine, our assistant, beautifully did and contributed to this. That's the flyer over there. Um, we said, is it, is it, is it a, a reading? Is it a workshop? Is it a dialogue? And finally we came up with the idea of calling it an interactive dialogue. But it's, it's really much more than interactive dialogue expresses and, and, and you'll see that as we go along. Um, this event is an embodiment of integrative processes in celebration of a master of integration. It will be an amalgam of meditation, focusing, readings, reflections, and conversation about the nature of spirituality and psychotherapy in relation to uplifting states. Uplifting was one of Eli's favorite words, mm -hmm. uplifting. Um, states such as awe, faith, love, compassion, joy, and gratitude. And those states, um, we can say they're spiritual, we, they're human states, they're transcendent states. And what, what are they? And we're going to sort of explore that together. The book and the event are born of Eli Dixon's passionate, relentless pursuit of integration. She wanted her book to represent her song, her individual expression of the great song. As such, it needed to transcend categories and couldn't fit into any boxes. And yet, she loved categories. <laughs> she had been a bond analyst before she became a psychotherapy and a psychotherapist and treasured logical constructions and ordered formulations. So we have here an integration not only of contents of ideas, but of style and purpose of the mediums of metaphor and carefully worked out linear prose, enhanced and given another set of wings by Rose's exquisite layout and photographs, and we'll be seeing them after the readings. Eli gave herself fully to this song, literally to her dying breath, and we will have the opportunity to sing it with her tonight and find new dimensions of our own songs and perhaps of our incarnations of the great song. Yes. And um, David is going to introduce the family. You don't have to stand up. I just stood up because mm -hmm. I'll stand kind up. Of stand up. <laughs> uh, and and, and uh, each person that speaks will take this. So I'm just going to bring this over to you. First of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Tom Donovan, uh, Eli's husband, who was my brother-in-law and for the last four years has become my brother. And, uh, uh, and we've gone on this journey together. And uh, then Rose, who created the, uh, the visual accompaniment to Elizabeth's book and has been, Elizabeth really in many ways was a mentor for Rose because Rose became maybe almost, maybe even slightly more at times obsessed with Myers-Briggs. <laughs> so if you want, if you want to, you need to talk with Rose a little bit about Myers-Briggs and uh, she she's has some great insights there. And then, uh, of course, I'd like to introduce my dear wife, Kate, uh, who became such a, such a close friend of Eli's uh, over the years and uh, we were just such a very close and dear family. And uh, I really want to thank the Mosaic Group and the Psychotherapy Group of work Lynn, group. the work group that, uh, that, that Lynn has, has mentored and uh, spirited forward because that was such an important group for, for Elizabeth uh, throughout her period here in New York. So I'm very pleased to be here. It's just wonderful that you were able to schedule this when we were available. 
and we're happy to be here and to share this experience. Thank you. Thank you. We're happy to have you. Yes. Uh, no, now we're going to do the two. This is a, a, in the focusing tradition. An attunement is something like a meditation, a visualization. It's a way of centering ourselves. And in the integrative process here, we're introducing that into our format. Mm. So someone said, let's begin, and then someone else said, Oh, the attunement first, and so attunement is a beginning always. So taking, oh, taking a couple of breaths and <laughs> inviting ourselves. Mm. Inviting ourselves to be here together. I'm sorry. Inviting ourselves to be here together. And how has it been thus far? Eating and drinking and meeting mm -hmm. and waiting and shuffling the schedule <laughs> that it worked mm -hmm. more beautifully. And hearing Lynn's words, so bring Eli's presence. I say in my meditation groups, taking a moment to set the intention for yourself to be as present and allowing and uh, caring of yourself as possible in our gathering here tonight and in our, I think, um, <coughs> the continued being fed with contemplation and conversation. That is, as it is written here, about our lived experience of awe, faith, love, compassion, and joy. It seems right to begin with awe. <clears throat> awe celebrates the mystery and wonder of life, but unlike wonder, it can also include an element of fear or dread. It is reserved for that which is more powerful than we are, or aspects of life that we can never fully know or understand. Oh, you know, when we pause, it's as if we're looking into the vast cavern of awe, don't you think? Because anything's possible. Mm -hmm. And I also think that awe is so important in our work 
to keep fresh and keep interested and alive. And it's more fun that way, too. Yeah, by far. <laughs> by far. Uh-huh. And when I was thinking of the word awe, I thought, I don't think you can open your mouth any more for any other sound. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> Let's all do it together. Oh. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> so the title of this chapter is What is Faith? And I'm going to read first a quote that Eli took from Paul Tillich. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. It is an element of faith. But that was very interesting. But what she says is um, we tend to think of faith and doubt as opposites. But if we examine these concepts in more detail, it becomes clear why this is not the case. If we lived in a world of certainty, without mystery or the challenge of infinity, then why would we need faith? If we fully understood the origins and nature of the universe and had the answers to all of our questions about the purpose and meaning of life, then the word faith would not need to exist it would not be necessary to take a leap of faith because the nature of ultimate reality would be a certainty to us. So, yeah, for me, um, and just one more, one more line, having faith in a general sense suggests a trust in life, a source of comfort and ease. So I was very touched by this paragraph when I was reading the book. It just really got to me, and um, that's why I chose it. Um, I had never put faith and doubt together in the same sentence, so it was it was sort of enriching to me. It sort of put, you know, sort of was helpful to me to think of it that way. And I do have both, so um, it, it was just I've just been thinking about it quite a bit since I read that. sort of take a breath after each person's <coughs> speaking and reading. And um, it, it struck me, Michelle, that I didn't say to people that everybody chose the passage that was meaningful to them and I'd be interested, we'd be interested in what would be meaningful to you, what would you choose, you know, if you were going to uh, choose one passage from this book. Well, it's probably not terribly surprising that <laughs> I also was interested in the passages around doubt. <laughs> um, in fact, I was always impressed that Eli had included a whole, you know, kind of chapter or section, the importance of doubt, yes. which mm-hmm. I was really grateful to her for, mm-hmm. um, because it seemed to me that uh, I was full of lots of doubt and <laughs> not as much faith. Um, but when she wrote in here that um, it was absolutely necessary that both needed to be included, uh, you know, it was a great awakening to me. Mm. And uh, in in that vein, she writes that um, she says that I find that some of the most beautiful poetry of spirituality addresses this place of no faith and offers ways to reframe our experience. It helps us to open the door to the unexpected. She has below an excerpt from the Mary Oliver poem, Wild Geese, that speaks to this mix of faith and doubt. Um, She says that just as the 23rd Psalm celebrates the uplifting qualities of faith, Mary Oliver's poem introduces the possibility of finding some way to belong, even in more troubled times. And this is the excerpt from Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. Tell me about your despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes over the prairies 
and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. Wild Geese is not about the profound experience of belonging that Brother, Brother David uh, Stendhal Rast, who she quotes at other times, describes as being at the heart of our feelings of aliveness. Instead, this poem touches on a different kind of belonging than may happen when we are not feeling as connected or inspired. The poem suggests the possibility of finding our place in the family of things, but doing so from a state of loneliness. Mm. The world can feel harsh, like the harsh call of the wild geese, but it can be exciting at the same time. It suggests that we might hear the world calling to us to belong, even in the darker times. Mm. And since so many people come to therapy in their dark times, um, and I've always found that, you know, that's not the moment to just kind of say, you, you gotta believe, you know, have faith. Um, I really appreciated that this, she gave us a way to link the dark times mm -hmm. to the aliveness that she also speaks of as faith. <clears throat> Are you speaking again? <clears throat> I'm loving already all that's been said. <laughs> so, um, my thing is about belonging. Mm. And those of you whose group I've been a part of um, know those issues of belonging for me. Love and universal belonging. By defining love as an unqualified yes to belonging, Brother David does not specifically introduce spiritual language. Yet the spiritual implications of his words become clearer when we explore what the word belonging means to him. For Brother David, the feeling of belonging with a person or any other aspect of life has the potential to extend further to a feeling of universal belonging. Love is not just about the one object of our love. It's also about coming nearer to the experience of ultimate belonging. Dark times, uh, clients come in dark times and uh, how they can be met and uh, invited into a belonging is part of the, I believe, you know, the, um, the miracle of the work. Um, and she goes on to quote Brother David. When we know at the end of our quests, what, excuse me, what we know at the end of our quest is the meaning of belonging and the driving force of our spiritual quest is our longing to belong. It's not the uh, easy, it's, it's not the lightest of times out there this past weekend. Um, and this uh, love and belonging, issues of belonging, uh, seem very pertinent right now. I'm grateful for this. 
I'm grateful for this book too, for so many reasons. Um, so I am going to uh, read from her chapter on compassion. Yes, I'm saying I'm going to read from her chapter on compassion. Okay, so Eli says, I propose that we define compassion as being together with suffering. Mm -hmm. I like the emphasis on the word with. When we feel compassion, we are joined together with the one who is suffering. The paradox is that even though compassion is joining with suffering, compassion is not an experience of suffering. Bringing in compassion makes it possible to transcend suffering and is associated with feelings of safety, intimacy, connection, love, and belonging. The source of compassion's power is that it is a heartfelt experience. To the extent that compassion comes from the heart, it offers a special kind of shelter the, to the distressed and possibly even an embrace. This is the most powerful form of compassion when we feel met at our place of greatest pain and suffering with a heartfelt embrace. And she goes on to that beautiful paragraph, I feel, where she says, Why do our hearts respond to the suffering of others? I believe at some gut level that we know that the pain of the other is somehow the same as our pain, even though we may experience it differently. In fact, it is not just the pain of the two of us, just the pain of the two of us, but some even bigger, more universal experience of pain or rawness or tenderness that is part of our shared humanity. If we are to connect with another person at the depths of our being, then this connection must include the sensitivity and vulnerability that seem to reside within us at these deepest levels. I think this is just beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um, just one more part about it, that whenever compassion shelters and embraces the distressed, we can assume that there is always the potential for healing, even in the more difficult or stuck mm -hmm. times. Um, I love this. I mean, I loved so many parts of this book. Um, but this particularly, I think, because so many people are asking me, uh, friends or even clients, uh, how do you do that? And as a therapist, you hear the pain of others all the time. And how do you do that? And at times, I don't know what to, how to answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think she gives a very good answer here, where, where it says, you know, to tr it transcends suffering that. Compassion transcends suffering and is associated with feelings of sa safety, intimacy, connection, love, and belonging. I really think she gave me some answers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. Although my focus is on uplifting emotional states, I do not intend to exclude the darker human emotions such as loneliness, despair, pain, grief, or fear. Spirituality would not be wor worth much if it did not acknowledge and embrace the full range of human experience. After all, what makes an experience uplifting is not the absence of the darker emotions, but rather a complex mix of all that we bring to these moments. So much of what is powerful about spirituality and psychotherapy is that we are challenged to bring our light and our darkness together. If spirituality failed to welcome the darker, frightened, or despairing side of our natures, it would only leave us feeling alienated. We still belong in our darker moments, maybe even more so. 
my fellow mosaics know that next to animals, this is my big issue. <laughs> so, um, I have heard so many times from clients, as I'm sure those of you who are therapists have, some variation of, I was told not to bother to come down to breakfast if I couldn't be cheerful. Mm. Or if I was crying or sad, I was sent to my room. Ironically, as I was putting together the order of the readings this morning, the final order, I had the radio on, and this is really true, I'm not lying. The song came over the radio. Smile when your heart is breaking, smile <laughs> when you know it's aching. <laughs> and what is that but a recipe for fragmentation and alienation <laughs> and the false self? You know, you can go, I'm sure you can all name, let a smile be your umbrella. Whenever I feel afraid, whenever you feel afraid, I hold my head erect and whistle a happy tune. If we demonize and catastrophize these feelings, then we deny ourselves the opportunity to be able to navigate them, to tolerate them, and to experience comfort in them if we're always pretending to be happy or cheerful. By definition, we are in an alienated state and we are keeping away comfort. The comfort that so many of us really have chosen. I was very struck looking at putting together the, um, the readings, how many of them really reflect the duality of these states. Um, and anything else I have to say is more than answered in the readings to come. <laughs> This is from um, Eli's chapter, or section of a chapter, The Compassionate Encounter with the Self, and it's from the section, uh, Why the Journey is Worthwhile. Eli says, It often happens that finding a place of belonging for that wounded, suffering, or vulnerable part of ourselves naturally brings forth feelings of loving compassion, and both clients and therapists share in the power and tenderness of those moments. When we take the risk to speak from a deeper place within us, the pain or sadness that is revealed can be transformed in the presence of the love that is released. And what had felt frightening or dark or heavy turns to relief and a sense of comfort. The tears and sadness may still be there, but the experience feels safe and loving. I want to emphasize that it is not just accepting ourselves, but embracing ourselves. It is a homecoming. I believe that for many of us, Undertaking some version of this type of encounter with the self is ultimately what gives us access to our light and opens up the possibility for finding the most happiness and joy. But the process of exposing our vulnerability in safe circumstances is not a one-time occurrence. We continue in therapy to allow these not-me parts to find expression. And long after our psychotherapy experience is over, life gives us many opportunities to successfully integrate this not-me into our lives in ways that make us both happier and stronger. This passion, passage resonated deeply with me. Um, it speaks to why we practice therapy. Um, Eli states a great truth here, that compassion of self and other is transcendent and transformative. You know, I, have, I have Eli's large format book in my office and every once in a while I'll just open it up and it feels like it says exactly what I need. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so that's what happened here when I, I was invited to choose something to, to read. I just opened the book and I just felt that it was Eli telling me what to read here. Oh, wow. And as well as, each, as so many of you said, you know, you chose something that was so in, in tune with you yourself. Right. Um, you won't be surprised that this is about beauty because that's a topic of great interest to me that a lot of people know. Um, spirituality as harmonizing. One of my favorite definitions of spirituality that incorporates these same themes of unity and belonging is attributed to American psychologist and philosopher William James. He conceptualizes generic 
religion or spirituality in a way that is simple and easy to remember, but at the same time is profound. We can think of spirituality as the attempt in harmony to be in harmony with an unseen order of things, quote unquote. As with the Tillich definition of faith, there is no specific reference to the content of faith. Tillich refers to the infinite, while James refers to an unseen order of things. It is not clear at any given moment whether this unseen order is benevolent or threatening or neutral, but when we are, are quote unquote in harmony, there is always an element of beauty as well as belonging. The melody may not always be beautiful, but singing in harmony always evokes a kind of beauty. Having faith is not about being passive, but rather it is very much about being in an active and ongoing relationship with this unseen order. Rather than just listening, we are joining in with the song. We cannot always be in harmony, but as James says, we can attempt to be. Eli's chosen some quotes from Parker Palmer that I'm going to read. Before you tell your life what you intend to do with it, let your life tell you what truths you embody, what values you represent. Our deepest calling is to grow into our own authentic selfhood, whether or not it confirm, conforms to some image of who we ought to be. As we do so, we will not only find the joy that every human being seeks, we will also find our path of, a, of authentic service to the world. Eli says about this, the most basic truth that comes from the literature on personal calling is that we must first learn to listen to ourselves. And this listening is often at a deeper level than what we are accustomed to and may take many years to accomplish. Letting our life speak is different from what our rational minds might want for us. It feels counterintuitive to bypass our more willful self and instead take the more humble position of listening. This kind of listening requires discipline and considerable patience, not something we tend to associate with vocational decision-making. We must learn to listen in a way that our souls can respond to. As, as Palmer says, the soul speaks its truth only under quiet, inviting, and trustworthy conditions. This speaks to me because I have trouble listening to myself in this, this way. And when I read this, I feel called, invited to listen in this very focused, quiet, humble, Eli says but very disciplined way. And I love the word humble. I think that word just focuses me because it's so empty of, of self in the sense of wanting and um, getting something. You know, it's really listening in that open way where whatever comes is welcome and I, I find that very rare but very very healing very comforting So I'm the brother David who Elizabeth knew long before she knew of David <laughs> Stendhal Raya. Uh, I would, number one, like to thank Elizabeth for 
including a chapter in faith. And secondly, I'd like to thank Barbara, because it was so fitting when Barbara sent Lynn the email saying, I want to cover issues of the issues of faith and doubt, but I hope someone will cover the 23rd Psalm. And I said, that was just an invitation. Thank you so much. So what I'm going to do, I, at first I was going to read the 23rd Psalm and then read from Eli's book, and then I thought I would read from Eli's book and help us hear the 23rd Psalm, Psalm in a different way, and then I have a very brief thing I'm going to read that was a reflection on these things. I propose to look at the 23rd Psalm through the eyes of someone who is spiritual but not necessarily religious. This psalm offers a poetic description of the lifetime journey of faith. By interpreting the 23rd Psalm as a metaphor rather than literally, it provides a basis for understanding faith in a broader spiritual way. The Lord could represent our own faith and wisdom, the part of ourselves that knows at the deepest level where the green pastures and still waters are. I can be my own shepherd, but only to the extent that I can experience a connection or alignment with what I would call a larger dimension of goodness or wisdom, something beyond myself, humble. By being in touch with this source of wisdom, I can feel guided and comforted. Now please listen carefully to the 23rd Psalm as metaphor. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As we get closer to the end of our walk through the valley, and as the shadow of death looms larger and begins to feel very real, the concepts of faith conveyed in, these, in this psalm become particularly relevant and compelling. Faith in this sense is built upon something that we know in the present moment rather than on a specific belief in redemption or a guarantee in life after death. In these moments of restoration, when our cups runneth over, the perfection and fullness of the present moment feels complete and the now feels eternal as if we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the four years that Elizabeth lived with her cancer diagnosis, her, trup, her cup truly runneth over. She married the love of her life, Tom Donovan. 
The relationship deepened between her two nieces, Molly and Rose, and their dear Auntie Elizabeth. She strengthened the bond with her mentor, Lynn Preston, and her psychotherapy colleagues. And she wrote a book she had wanted to write for 20 years that became her legacy. These four years were her act of faith. In the words of Paul Tillich, an act of a finite being who is grasped by and turned to the infinite. Thank you, David. So it is hard to just read without creating a context of the love and the joy it was to travel this journey with Elizabeth. I met Elizabeth in 1980. She was hard-nosed. She was inquisitive. She was brilliant. She, her goal was to move from Mayor Koch's office to Wall Street. And she did it, and I don't quite know those years, but she was deeply fueled with the energy of wanting just to tackle the issues of economics and the issue of being a bond analyst on Wall Street. And of course, she did that. Um, but by the 90s, she also knew that her, her soul and she was awakening to her soul. And she found a way to work her way through that, and she found her master's in social work as a beginning. And it was a tough ride, and many of you probably know this. She would reach into it, and then she would pull back, and she'd say, I don't agree with 99% of that. It's just <laughs> fluff. It's pure fluff, you know. And she would rail on it, and she would just go after it, and we'd have these <coughs> very intense conversations. And then Tom came into her life, and it was, and she didn't soften some of that railing, but she had a partner that <laughs> softened, that would have those tirades with her. No, actually. But what Tom and Elizabeth, what Elizabeth learned with Tom was love. Unfailing, unconditional, true love. And it shifted Elizabeth. It shifted her sense of who she was. It opened her heart and her soul to do things that she had wanted internally to figure it out, but hadn't been able to do it. And then she found this group. I have heard about this group for, I don't know, 10, 15 years maybe. I don't know quite how long you guys have been meeting on Mondays, but I know about the Monday meetings <laughs> and have heard much about them. And it was through this awakening, um, and I really believe that Tom was such a core part of that, is that w awakening of love, and then the love that was extended here was just a mighty force. And then her own, Elizabeth's own wrestle, and as people have been reading tonight, this is Elizabeth's memoir. Yeah. It is her memoir. She started with awe. She could handle awe, because she experienced it in lots of ways. But all the way through, she struggled with each one of these very deep concepts. And we hear that in all of her writing, that it's the painful side that is balancing that joyful experience of faith and compassion. But it isn't faith and compassion without that struggle that mighty struggle and that was part of what I learned and the gift that Elizabeth shared with me was 
um, you know, I kind of like to be on that Pollyanna side a little bit, you know, and kind of say, well, you know, let's figure out this idea about transformation. And Elizabeth, you know, would call it, and she'd say, well, how do you have transformation without pain? Or however she would say that. And so when she started writing this book four years ago, it was just magical how it unfolded and how she, again, struggled. And you all know the challenge that and the work that she put into it. I mean, there is not a word in this book that she hasn't struggled over. And it's brilliantly written because of that. And so I don't know if if it was just happenstance or the fact that my plane was late today, but I shifted from awe to the end and um, had the opportunity to read a little bit about joy and gratitude. And I just need to say that this last year of Elizabeth's life was so evident of her joy. She had reached a place of just amazing joy and gratitude in her in her being and her life and she wasn't going to let it go easily but she was the, she had that presence there and so I'd like to just read that a little bit and I'll try to stop whimpering um, so joy versus happiness which I think is just an incredible um, insight. Happiness can occur at any point in our lives, but finding joy often takes a lifetime. Joy is not guaranteed. It seems to be something that we must earn after we struggle with life's challenge and emerge stronger and wiser as a result. But once we have really found joy, it claims a permanent place within us. Even though we cannot always access it, joy does not desert us. Unlike happiness, which is fleeting, joy is associated with the words like abiding, everlasting, immutable. And a quote by D Brother David, gratefulness, the heart of prayer. We hold the key to lasting happiness in our own hands, for it is not joy that makes us grateful. This is where it shifts to gratitude. It is gratitude that makes us joyful. Isn't that true? Oh, I've got one more little... And then last, but definitely not least, the beauty of our world is magnified by the tragic awareness that we are about to lose it. When life feels poignant in this way, it is e easier to feel grateful. We see more clearly the preciousness of all that we will leave behind. Thus, for many people, there is the irony of feeling more grateful and therefore more joyful at the same time that life feels the most precarious. Thank you, Eli. Um, the passage that I chose was the passage called Joining the Great Song. And um, I chose it partly because uh, Eli says, this was my very favorite of all the spiritual poetry. And I resonated with it very, very deeply myself. And I think the reason that I resonated with it deeply is because um, I think I felt a kind of kinship with Eli as I got to know her because I didn't consider myself spiritual. I didn't even know what the word meant. Um, I had studied the hard sciences, and um, and in my teens I discovered um, cosmology, and I became absolutely uh, entranced by the study of the cosmos. 
and the vastness and the intricacy and the awesomeness of it and the mystery of it. And it was in that place that I, I sort of felt a twinship with uh, Eli around the idea of spirituality. And I'm going to read to you now from a poem. It's such a beautiful poem. It's, it's by D uh, Brother David Stendhal, the other brother. Stendhal, <laughs> the other brother. Um, and it, he calls it Hymn to the Great Song. There's only one song, and it's the great song, the cosmic song. It's the song that all things and all animals and all plants and all humans sing in their deepest heart. And every song that a human being sings with his or her voice is only an expression of that one great song that is there from the beginning and will be there after the end. And then she goes on to say, it is difficult to imagine a greater achievement than being able to sing the great song. In doing so, we have the honor of joining with all the things animals, plants, and humans who are singing from their deepest heart. Each of the participants offers their own unique voice, and yet all of these voices are ultimately an expression of that one great cosmic song, which is eternal. It is there from the beginning and will be there after the end. It, it unites us with all of life in the ultimate experience of belonging. When we join with life in this way, joy and gratitude naturally follow. And the thing that I love about it is it really captures for me the enormity of uh, 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 and the infinite possibilities for connectedness and for belonging. It feels like the thing that links all of these themes of compassion and joy and and um, can't even remember awe the other one. Faith. Awe and faith. <laughs> yes, uh, the, uh, that they're all linked by by the concept of belonging, or that's what's most yeah. meaningful to me. <laughs> that in the end, we all belong oh. to something that we we that's awesome. That's beyond our comprehension. Mm -hmm. And there's something har terrible and wonderful about it. And mysterious. And mysterious. Well, very mysterious. Yeah. Very mysterious. Mm -hmm.